welcome to Tala Talks NICU. I'm Dr. Tala, and today we're going to be talking about sepsis. This is actually part three in the series where we've talked about sepsis. So if you haven't seen the last two, go back and watch them now. We are now on point 13, and that is what antibiotics do we start for late onset sepsis? We already talked about the antibiotics that we start generally after a baby is born to prevent early onset sepsis or to treat early onset sepsis. And in many institutions in the US, that is ampicillin and gentamicin. Ampicillin to cover the gram positives, so to cover group B strep and enterococcus, and gentamicin to cover the gram negatives, so E. coli, Klebsiella, etc. For late onset sepsis, the antibiotics you start are really going to depend on whatever infection you think you're treating, as well as what the most likely organisms are. So maybe this baby had a previous infection with, for example, a Klebsiella. You have to make sure that you're definitely going to cover that same bacteria again. Maybe in the institution, the hospital that you work at, all of the E. coli are resistant to gentamicin. That would be bad, but let's just say it is. And if you're really worried about this being a gram-negative rod, then you're probably not going to start gentamicin or another aminoglycoside. So it's important to know not just what's happening in your patient, but also what are the general bugs that you're seeing in the NICU as well as in the hospital as a whole. Whatever antibiotics you choose, generally you start with much more broad spectrum coverage, which means that you start with antibiotics, and it's normally more than one, that are going to cover a huge variety of potential bacteria that could be in the baby. So we call those broad spectrum antibiotics. If you get a bug or you're less worried, then you can end up narrowing down the antibiotics, whether you take one off or whether you actually change the antibiotics to something that isn't as all-encompassing of killing all bacteria. Generally though, just like with the early onset sepsis, you should be covering from a gram positive as well as for a gram negative rod. Another big bug that you have to think about in late onset sepsis is Staphylococcus. So this is especially true if the baby still has central lining. So for example, they had to have a PIC line, a Broviac, or an umbilical line. If you are worried that that baby is getting an infection, then you should probably be covering for Staphylococcus. If it's just kind of a routine Staphylococcus aureus and you're not too worried about any resistances, then you can start Nafcicillin or Oxacillin, which basically is the same class as the methicillin. So here you are assuming that this is a methicillin sensitive staph aureus. But generally late onset sepsis with any line, you need to be covering for the staph aureus. If you are worried about MRSA, so you know the baby's colonized with MRSA, some units routinely check to see if babies are colonized with MRSA, or if the baby's had it in the past, or the baby looks really sick, then maybe you just go ahead and start vancomycin. Vancomycin would treat the MRSA. Just a little aside, and I know I shouldn't go down rabbit holes, but I really want to say this. Vancomycin is not a great drug. Yes, we use it because it will get MRSA, but if the infant does have MSSA, it has the regular staph aureus, then methicillin will be much better at killing that bug and making the baby better sooner than the vancomycin. So don't automatically use vancomycin just because you're like, well, it could be MRSA. Really, the staph aureus will be a lot more sensitive to methicillin or oxacillin or nafcicillin, whatever you use in your hospital, as compared to the vancomycin. Another staphylococcus aside, and remember, staphylococcus, they come back in bunches, right? So like all the little staph, the gram-positive cocci hang out in like grape-like bunches, just as an aside. So staphylococcus epidermidis is something that we all have on our skin. Normally, if adults have a positive blood culture for staph epi, it's considered just a contaminant. So somebody accidentally got it into the sample and it's not really growing. Sometimes though, in babies, staph epi can actually cause an infection. And the only thing that gets staph epi is also vancomycin. So if you are worried about a true infection with staph epi, the baby has to be on vancomycin. If you're worried about neck or necrotizing enterocolitis, then in addition to the gram-positive and gram-negative coverage, 
Often we also want to cover anaerobes or anaerobic bacteria because we know that there are so many anaerobic bacteria in the gut. So often if you really are worried about neck, especially if there is a perforation, then you'd want to start Flagyl, which is metronidazole or clindamycin or like Azosin, which is piperacillin and tazobactam. All of those would cover the anaerobic bacteria in addition to the gram positive and gram negative that you also need to be covering. So really to emphasize again, the antibiotics that you give are really going to depend on the situation for the baby as well as previous infections and everything that the baby's had. And you start big and strong and then you narrow down if you can. 14, how long should we actually treat infections for? Again, obviously that really depends. And this is kind of like a changing target. Nobody's really sure how long we should be treating everything for. And even in the time that I've been practicing, there are a few diseases that we're now not treating for as long. A friend of mine, a pediatric surgeon, once told me that we should treat neonatal infections for the number of days that would be considered a reasonable American football score. So three days, seven days, 10 days, 14 days, 21 days, anything in between we just can't do because it's not an American football score. Generally though, we're going to treat until the symptoms are pretty much resolved and the blood work is normalizing. So if your CRP is still 10 times what it's supposed to be, then you should probably be continuing the antibiotics a little bit longer. But to run through a few kind of average lengths, a cellulitis, so a skin infection, we would treat for five to seven days. Pneumonia, we would treat five to seven days, normally closer to kind of five days. A bacteremia, we would treat seven to really 14 days, I would say about 10 days. A meningitis, we would treat two weeks to three weeks, so 14 to 21 days. And neck, we treat somewhere between 10 to 14 days. Again, this is kind of inch down since I've been practicing. You can see how random all of this is. We don't have very strict criteria and every single baby is just so different in their presentation and in just how sick they are. So really it should depend on the patient, but the shorter the course of antibiotics that you can give the baby, and still treat the baby, the better it will be for the baby in the long run. Antibiotics wipe out everything in the baby, so the sooner you can stop them, the better. 15. What is the minimum length of treatment that you should give baby that appears sick? So say you have a really sick baby in the unit and you're worried about sepsis, so you send blood and you start antibiotics. Now let's say 24 hours later, the baby looks a lot better. Do you stop the antibiotics then? And what should make you make that decision? Well, logically, it should depend on how long it takes a positive blood culture to come back. If it takes eight days for the blood culture to come back as positive, if there is bacteria on it, then we should probably be treating that baby for eight days. As we all know, it's not eight days. In fact, a recent study done on NICU babies showed that it takes between 15 to 16 hours for the majority of blood cultures to come back as positive. By 24 hours, 91% are positive. By 36 hours, 95% are positive. And by 48 hours, 99% are positive. So to reiterate, at 48 hours, 99% of the blood cultures that are going to end up being positive are positive. And that's where really that 48 hour rule out came from. That if we stop them at 48 hours, we can be pretty certain that we've caught every blood culture. There is gonna be that 1%. At 24 hours, it's 91% positive. So you could still be missing, let's say 8%, 99 take away 91, if you stop them at 24 hours instead of at 48 hours. How quickly a blood culture becomes positive is really going to depend on the bacterial load in the baby. If there's like billions of bacteria swimming around in the baby's blood, that's much more likely to become positive sooner. The other big thing is it will depend on the institution that you work at. Some labs are only looking at the pathology plates where you're looking to see if the bacteria is growing during daylight hours. So depending when you send it, it might be more than 48 hours before somebody calls it as being positive. So make sure that you get comfortable with your own institution as well.
Number 16, when should you minimize antibiotics? So we already said that when you're worried about an infection, you start with the big guns. You start to make sure that you're covering the possible causes of whatever's causing the infection. And then as you find out more, then you want to kind of minimize the antibiotics. So you're not like gonna get pan resistance in the unit because you're constantly using these really aggressive antibiotics. And the point is here, do not minimize antibiotics based on a gram stain. So like we already said, it normally takes about 24 hours for the blood culture to come back positive. But when the, the lab first tells you that it's positive, they'll tell you something like, oh, it's gram positive cocci in clusters or something. Then it normally takes another day or another few hours to tell you, yep, it's staphylococcus. And then maybe another day or another two days after that to tell you, oh, these are the antibiotics that it's resistant to or sensitive to. But what you need to know is sometimes the bacteria and the lab just gets it wrong. So sometimes a bacteria can really look like something on gram stain and then it ends up growing a completely different culture. So even if you see a gram positive cocci at 24 hours, do not stop your coverage for the gram negative rod. So don't stop your gentamicin or whatever else the baby is on because sometimes we are wrong about that. So again, do not make your antibiotics more narrow spectrum based on the gram stain. Wait for the final cultures and sensitivities come out. You may use it the other way. Say your baby is on ampingent and then at 24 hours the lab calls and says that there's gram negative rods growing in the blood. At that point, you might want double coverage for the gram negative rods, or you might be worried that the gentamicin or whatever the baby is on, it, the bacteria might actually be resistant to that. So you can add antibiotics based on the gram stain, but you definitely don't want to take antibiotics away dependent on the gram stain. 17, how do we diagnose meningitis? So like we already said, we end up getting lumbar punctures or spinal taps very often on neonates because we are so worried about their weak immune system and their weak blood-brain barrier. So it doesn't take a lot for an infection in the blood or anywhere else to actually get into the CSF. So we have to figure out whether a baby has meningitis often. And as you can imagine, if a baby is really sick, then we don't wanna wait around and get a spinal tap. We're trying to get the antibiotics into that baby as quickly as possible. And often the baby is not stable enough to get a spinal tap within the first two, three days even of the infection. Maybe the platelets are really low, maybe the baby is on presses, and any time the baby is moved to even position for a spinal tap, then the baby decompensates. So often, when we are obtaining the cerebrospinal fluid from the spinal tap, often it's pre-treated, which means that the baby's already received antibiotics, which means that there's a good chance that even if the baby did have an infection, the culture will remain negative. So even if the culture is negative, we can still look at other findings on the CSF fluid to kind of give us a clue that the baby had an infection. And the most important one is a very high WBC count. So generally anywhere above 30. Really, if the baby has meningitis, it's probably going to be above 100. But really above 30, especially with no or very few red blood cells is concerning for meningitis. The white blood cells in a baby with meningitis are going to have a, be a majority of neutrophils. So if you have like 90% neutrophils and a WBC count of 60, then that's really concerning in the CSF. You could also have a very low glucose in meningitis. So normally it's kind of like a third to a half of the glucose in the baby's blood at the time of the CSF. So if you are doing a lumbar puncture, then you should have a glucose pretty close to when you're actually doing that procedure. Also a high protein count, so kind of above 150 to 200 can also be suggestive of meningitis. As you all know, a bloody tap can really ruin all these numbers. It can result in really high protein, really high WBCs. So once your red blood cells start coming up, it's really not as helpful. So that's the caveat, that if you're waiting to get a spinal tap after you've started antibiotics, you really want a nice clean tap. 18, what do you do when you have a positive blood culture? So the first thing that you do is look at your antibiotics. Are you on antibiotics? And if you are on antibiotics, are you on enough antibiotics? 
Like we said already, the initial positivity will be called back with just a gram stain. So for example, if they call back and say, we've got gram negative rods, and maybe you want to add more gram negative rod coverage, or maybe the baby's super sick and they call back and say it's gram positive coccyne clusters, which again, remember we talked about that being staphylococcus. So you're worried about kind of the grape-like clusters. At that point, if the baby's really sick, even if the baby was on ampicillin, I might want to add vancomycin at that point to make sure that we're covering for any possible bacteria. Generally though, even before you're adding extra antibiotics or changing the antibiotics, you want to repeat that blood culture. So pretty much as soon as the lab calls you and tells you we've got a positive blood culture, your first step should be, I should want to repeat it and I need to check the antibiotics. If it's a blood culture, then you want it done really probably ASAP. If it's a positive urine or a CSF culture, then generally we're repeating those towards the end of the treatment course. And that was it, the end of our series on sepsis. I hope that you found all those points clinically helpful. Hopefully they will help you at bedside. If you like this video, then please press a like and please subscribe if you're interested in neonatal content. Otherwise, we really just want to thank you for being here. If you do comment to us, then please let us know where you're writing in from. We love knowing where in the world you're all from. Thank you so much.